Hi all, two announcements. The Discord group for premium subscribers to my Bulletin newsletter launches today. Subscribers will get access to premium-only interviews, have a say in which guests and topics are covered on Unchained, get to weigh in on what questions are asked, and we'll have access to subscriber-only chats with guests. Our first AMA is this Friday at noon Eastern, and it's on a topic I'm sure many of you will have questions about, crypto taxes for 2021. One of the first guests will be someone who, until recently, was the crypto person at the IRS. Join now for $4.99 a month or $4.49.99 a year at laurashin.bulletin.com slash subscribe. For those of you who don't have Facebook accounts, we are figuring out another way for you to at least join the Discord. I will keep you posted. Again, to sign up for the premium offering, head to laurashin.bulletin.com slash subscribe. Also, if you become a premium Bulletin subscriber, plus do what it takes to receive a signed book plate, which you'll hear how to do below, then you will receive a PO app. So for those of you who've asked me how you can get a signed copy of my book, here's how. First, pre-order the link, which you can do at bit.ly slash cryptopians. Second, make a social media post about the book that includes the pre-order link, bit.ly slash cryptopians, or links to the book on any bookseller of your choice. Third, email hello at unchainedpodcast.com with the subject line, signed book plate. In the email, include a PDF of your receipt, a link to your social media post, and the address to which you'd like me to send the book plate, plus the name of who you'd like me to dedicate the book plate to. If you become a premium subscriber and do what it takes to receive a signed book plate, then you will also receive a PO app. We will put all this info in the show notes and in the daily newsletter, so don't worry about memorizing it. And now, on to the show. Hi everyone, welcome to Unchained, your no-hype resource for all things crypto. I'm your host, Laura Shin, a journalist with over two decades of experience. I started covering crypto six years ago, and as a senior editor at Forbes, was the first mainstream media reporter to cover cryptocurrency full-time. This is the February 15th, 2022 episode of Unchained. Bosonic is the new decentralized financial market infrastructure. Want real best execution? Want to keep your assets at your custodian? Want zero counterparty risk? You need Bosonic. Bosonic ensures fiduciary certainty for institutional digital assets trading. Alchemy Pay is the pioneer of the world's first truly hybrid crypto and fiat payment network that makes real world crypto payments easy, secure, and instant for both merchants and users. Alchemy Pay, bridging fiat and crypto economies. Buy, earn, and spend crypto on the crypto.com app. New users can enjoy zero credit card fees on crypto purchases in the first 30 days. Download the Crypto.com app and get $25 with the code LAURA, link in the description. This episode of Unchained is brought to you by Beefy Finance, the multi-chain yield optimizer. Beefy is the easiest way to earn more from your crypto. Deposit funds into Beefy's secure vault to auto-compound yield across 12 blockchains. Got crypto? Choose Beefy. Today's topic is 2021 taxes for crypto people. Here to discuss are Shihan Chandra Sekara, certified public accountant and head of strategy tax at Cointracker, and John Cardone, senior director of Washington National Tax at RSM US LLP. Welcome, Shihan and John. Good afternoon. Yeah, thanks for having us. Can you each briefly describe your background and how you came to know this area of crypto taxes? Shihan, why don't we start with you? Sure. Um, so uh, I've been a CPA uh, ever since I started my career. Got into crypto around 2016, 2017 time period, uh, and then joined Cointracker in the early days um, as the head of tax strategy and I started building the software there. Yeah, so that's a little bit about my background. And John? I have a long history of government service in tax controversy, representing the IRS in court and then uh, district court and tax court. I also served as an executive at the IRS, and I first got introduced to uh, digital assets and cryptocurrency back when the IRS was issuing a John Doe summons to uh, Coinbase, and I was supervising the agents that were involved with that. 
Uh, I then continued on with some of the IRS enforcement programs uh, around digital assets before coming to RSM. Great. All right. So let's start our discussion with a quick overview of crypto taxes. Let's first start with the main taxable events. What are those? Sure, I'll, I'll go ahead. Um, so cryptocurrencies are treated as property according to the IRS, notice that 2014-21. So that treatment uh, results in your different types of taxable event when you do different, different things. So let me make, break down the five different types of events that could lead to a taxable event. So number one, just cashing out crypto, pretty self-explanatory. You could have Bitcoin, you're cashing it out, you got to pay capital gain taxes. Number two is when you uh, trade one cryptocurrency to another. So you could be going from Ethereum to Bitcoin or Bitcoin to Litecoin. You don't necessarily uh, have to realize any cash, but the property treatment gives rise to a taxable event. Uh, number three is when you spend cryptocurrencies to buy a, a good or service. You could be buying a subscription or you could be buying a Tesla. Uh, that triggers a taxable event. And then number four is when you earn cryptocurrencies. Uh, there are so many ways that you can earn cryptocurrencies. It could be through wages, uh, interest income, uh, you know, mining income, um, staking income, which is somewhat arguable. We'll, we'll get into that later. So whenever you earn cryptocurrency, that triggers a taxable event. Uh, and then the last one is when you go through a, a hard fork and receiving a new type of cryptocurrency, or you're getting airdropped a, a new type of token, that triggers a taxable event. So, so those are the five situations that you need to remember. Uh, if you go through any of those situations, uh, you could have a taxable or reportable thing to that you need to report on your taxes. And John, do you want to expound on how those different events are taxed and how people should think about their tax rates? Sure. Generally, in, in some of the events that Xi'an described, when you cash out or, or when you exchange cryptocurrency, that's when you exchange property. When you, you know, you could exchange property, you sell property, you exchange one piece of property for another piece of property, which would be be barter. Generally, if it's property that you've held, um, that you've you've acquired and held and sold, that would be taxed as a capital gain. If it's property that you uh, earn, uh, like uh, income uh, or uh, uh, proceeds, then then that's that's taxed as ordinary income. Uh, she also talked about that there's uh, some of the, some of the some of the questions that are unclear involve certain kinds of coins, uh, what they call staking. Is that created? Are you creating property or are you earning property through your work? So uh, generally, though, it's a, it's, it's a capital treatment. Okay, yeah, we will definitely discuss staking in more depth later on in this episode. Um, but first, let's talk about kind of some of the things that will probably be top of mind for crypto people for this year's tax season. And I personally think that this discussion probably will start with NFTs. So let's um, give an overview of how NFTs are taxed. And we can look at both how they're taxed for creators as well as buyers. Sure. Uh, 2021, uh, I think it was the year of the NFTs. Uh, if anybody asked me what was the hottest topic, if it wasn't Bitcoin, it wasn't DeFi, it was NFTs. Uh, and, and those people who uh, made money to NFTs and also who lost money to NFTs uh, are going through the tax filing season right now. So it's really important for them to know what needs to be reported and how to get those numbers. So speaking of NFT taxes, there are two ways that you can interact with NFTs. Uh, one, as a, as a trader, you, you can just uh, flip NFTs and make money. Uh, the other way is uh, as a creator, you can create NFTs and put it on marketplaces like OpenSea so people can buy it and you can earn royalties. So let me kind of walk through uh, NFT trader taxes. So NFTs are very similar to cryptocurrencies, at least in terms of how, uh, you know, when it comes to tax uh, implications. So you have a purchase price, you have a sales price, uh, fancy terms, you know, cost basis and the sales proceeds. Uh, if you make a profit, those uh, profits are subject to capital gain taxes, similar to any uh, other, you know, cryptocurrency. So uh, pretty, you know, clear that area. And obviously, if you bought an NFT and that NFT lost in value, and then you're disposing that NFT at a loss, you're also eligible to get that kind of capital loss. So that's that's how NFT taxes work, you know, at a high level for traders. One thing to note is that, you know, some of these NFTs are based on artwork. Uh, like, you know, Board Ape Yacht Club, and there are so many other projects. 
So those artwork-based NFTs could be treated as a collectible under the IRS tax code. And if they're deemed as collectible, uh, those collectible gains are subject to a higher long-term capital gains, uh, up to 28% uh, versus the highest uh, capital gain tax rate that's subject, uh, which is 20% that's uh, applicable to regular crypto coins and stuff. So something to keep in mind uh, if you're specifically dealing with art-based NFTs. So yeah, at a, at an, in a nutshell, that's how you know NFT taxes work for uh, you know for creators. And for creators, uh, obviously, you can uh, you know hire some people and you know create like you know uh, I don't know like certain types of images within a certain characteristic. It could be you know thousand uh, of of certain type of character, and you can put it on sale for uh, places like OpenSea and Super Rare. If you're a creator, every time you sell those NFTs, that triggers a taxable event for you, uh, and the the amount of taxes uh, amount of income you need to report is the market value that you receive at the time you're selling that uh, NFT to somebody. And that could also be subject to self-employment taxes, which is another, you know, layer of taxes you need to pay if you're in the business of, you know, uh, if you're a creator, if you're a full-time creator, you got to pay income taxes and also self-employment taxes because that's your trade of business. Uh, again, so you get income, you report income, and obviously if you have any business-related expenses, you get to use those expenses to offset your income. In some cases, you could also get royalty income, you know, when that NFT gets traded in the secondary market, and that also constitutes income to you uh, at the time you receive those royalty rewards. So the trick for both creators and the traders is that kind of, you know, capturing those, you know, income events and converting those tokens into the market value every time you receive them and, and figure out your uh, capital gains that you need to pay taxes on, which is a very, very cumbersome task. But uh, if you went through the NFT, uh, that saga in 2021, I don't think it's a, it's a saga. I think it's going to continue to happen. Make sure you, 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 you have, uh, you know, good record so you can uh, compile your, you know, capital gains and capital losses. So one issue related to NFTs that I wanted to discuss was people are also using them as kind of like way like tickets almost to get into DAOs or for, you know, access to chat groups or whatever it might be. Are those pretty much taxed the same way as you just outlined or because they have a different usage, are they taxed any differently? So I think you're talking about uh, using your NFT to authenticate into some type of platform uh, or get access to some type of thing. I don't see that creating a taxable event. Uh, I mean, obviously you're using an asset that you have to access something, you know, valuable. Uh, you're not disposing of that asset, you know, you still own it. So it shouldn't create a taxable event. Oh, well, and but what if they sell like for F to, for friends with benefits? Yeah, if they sell their. If you, uh, I, I mean, if you, I agree with you in that you know the initial purchase of the NFT and the use to get into an event, or uh, then then I agree that that wouldn't be a taxable uh, event. However, if you know if the event turns out to be a historic occasion that. 10 years later, maybe is, is, is has a value in and of itself as a, a memento of that event or, or a separate, uh, then, then it might fall into the collectability realm where if you just sold it, I, I'm not, you know, that, that, that looks more like it's a collectible that, that something is sold. But even then, if there's no history, it would just be a, a it would be a sale or exchange of the NFT. Okay. And, but also for something like friends with benefits where, I'm just trying to, because a part of me is like, wait, do they burn those? But I don't think they do. I think people just buy and sell them. I mean, if it's something like a uh, like a, a club or membership club, then I think those have those have value, and 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 you sell those, you would deduct your basis. You would deduct your basis in in those, but then those could be taxable on on a resale. Okay, yeah, which is you know because the price of those has definitely fluctuated, so people weren't buying and selling them for the same price. So, okay. So it sounds like then they are taxed. If anybody's using an NFT as, as a ticket, like in simple example, and, and, you know, you're waiting at the, out of the stadium and you're buying a ticket for hundred dollars and, you know, selling it for $200, it is a taxable event, uh, because you're, you're, you're profiting from that thing. So if we apply the same scenario into NFTs and if people are flipping NFT tickets or access to some type of event. Uh, technically, it's a taxable event. Okay. 
just so I understand about the collectible issue, it sounds like different NFTs would be treated differently depending on the nature of that NFT. So obviously, you know, everybody, when they think about NFTs, goes first to JPEGs or art, but obviously there's, you know, things like domain names or, you know, now music or, I mean, there's, there's just a huge variety. So like, how would the IRS think about what is a collectible or how would you determine it when you go to pay your taxes or your accountant or whoever? I would want to see more of a history of a market for a collectible. I don't think, given that there isn't a lot of uh, guidance on point, I'm not really sure that the IRS it will want to wade into the collectability of whether something is a collectible so, so early on in the life of an NFT. Um, I'm, I'm not to say that that won't change later on or that there won't be more specific guidance out there. But I, th I think at this point that uh, if, if a taxpayer you know, records a reasonable purchase price, uh, um, you know, records their basis and recognizes the the income when it, if it is sold or, or traded, that I think that they're probably in a pretty sound position uh, and the, the IROS won't start looking at a, 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 a collectible, you know, determination. Oh, so you would actually think that that's kind of a less likely scenario? I, I do. I, until, I, I, I think really until these, they're, uh, NFTs are older till there's a history of them, uh, you know, almost like artwork, uh, you know, like a, a provenance that you can see the history of the sales that, 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 that people are doing this as, is a, as, you know, as, as an appreciation or a collectible versus now, I, I think the market's just too early. They're more like an investment at this, at this point in time. And then just to go back I wanted to make sure I understood. And uh, Shihan, you may have misspoke because you were saying that. So even though it seems like the collectible thing isn't an issue for now, did you say that even the long-term capital gain on that would be 28% or did you mean short-term? So just to add to what Joan mentioned, uh, yeah, Iris has not issued any NFT specific tax guidance, uh, but uh, there are code sections that define what a collectible is. And that code section is very broad. Uh, it says, you know, any type of artwork or any type of, uh, I don't know, music and et cetera, uh, could be treated as a collectible. So uh, some conservative taxpayers, they have started, you know, creating some of these art based NFTs as uh, collectible just to be on the safe side. But I completely agree with what John mentioned, you know, IRS hasn't said anything. Uh, if you're reporting something, uh, even if it's not like a, if, even if it's not treated as a collectible, that would be the better way to go about things. Coming back to your question, Laura. So if, it is deemed as a collectible, uh, then your long-term capital gain tax rate goes from 20% to 28% if you're a high net worth individual. So the, the idea is that, you know, IRS came up with this in a collectible, you know, tax code section in the 90s. So the idea is that, you know, if you, if you have collectible gains, you're considered to be like a super high net worth individual. So uh, I guess it's reasonable to have, have them subject to a higher tax rate, uh, like 8% higher tax rate than regular stocks and crypto coins are subject to. So that's where that, you know, the diff tax rate deferral comes from. Okay. And then for people who have been trading exchanges, I know the forms that they uh, might have gotten over the years may have changed. For this year, what forms could people expect to get and how would they then use those forms? Yeah, I mean, even this year, like, you know, we, we see different types of forms issued by different exchanges and wallets. 109 and miscellaneous is a pretty common form that you're going to see if you, if you staked uh, or earn some type of reward inside any of these exchanges. And if your reward income was more than $600 in a, in a given year. So you're going to get that form and that form typically goes on the schedule one that's considered other income. Another form that we see that, that, that has caused a lot of confusion is, is the form 1099K, uh, which reports your gross proceeds every month. And it doesn't report your cost basis. Uh, so, and as soon as the taxpayer gets it, they're, they're like, okay, th these numbers are wrong. These numbers are, you know, highly inflated and they naturally they blame at the exchange. But the reality is that the form 1099K uh, doesn't have any place to report the cost basis. So the exchanges are doing what they're supposed to do under the 1099K reporting rule. Then your job is to kind of figure out the cost basis and pay the taxes on your actual net 
capital gains uh, and or claim a, like a net loss. So something to keep in mind. So just because you get a 1099K doesn't mean that you have to pay taxes on that entire gross amount. As soon as you add the cost basis, your tax liability is going to go down a lot. Another form uh, we see today, uh, in some exchanges, they issue form 1099Bs. That has uh, a lot of you know valuable information for the taxpayer. It has your purchase date for your coins, sold date for your coins, purchase price, uh, and in some cases, the cost basis as well. If you get a form 1099B, that's that's a very friendly form to you. If the form is complete and if you if you believe the numbers look right, your job is to just put that information from that form to Schedule D and the form 8949 of the tax return. And if you're using like a DIY software, um, it's just a it's just an easy way to kind of file your taxes. Now that said, there could be some 1099Bs you're going to be receiving this tax season with missing cost basis. Uh, we can talk about you know why. You know, some exchanges cannot figure out the cost basis because, you know, how the space works. But if it says, you know, missing cost basis or zero cost basis, you got to find out the cost basis. If you do not find the cost basis, you're going to be paying more taxes on that gross amount because you're not accounting for how much you paid for that coin. Uh, so just to summarize, you're going to see 1099 miscellaneous, 1099 Ks, uh, 1099 Bs. And then finally, this is not a tax form, but some Exchange is going to issue uh, like a transaction history report. This is mainly the overseas ones. Uh, so you can go to their tax center, just download like all the transactions you did uh, throughout the year. Uh, so that's another type of, I guess, a form that you can expect. And then, and then finally, no forms at all, right? If you <laughs> traded in uh, MetaMask, there's, there's nothing for you to, to download. So yeah, so those are the variations that you can expect this tax season. I hope someday that you know that the IRS will will prescribe a 1099 for digital assets, so that it will be a lot easier for taxpayers. And I and I think you know, uh, Shane went through the list of forms. I think uh, you know when I was at the IRS, we recognized that there's imperfections in the way that the forms uh, r- report now, that they don't prescribe basis. I, I think the 1099K is probably the least accurate of, of the of the ones. Your 1099B. If, it, if you've sold on one exchange, will be the most accurate. As Sheehan said, that the, the most important thing for the taxpayer to do is, is to do their best to report the income and, and their basis as accurately as possible. And if it doesn't exactly match up with what's on the form and your 1099K will never show basis, that's okay. Is, you know, if, if you have your downloads, if you have your other records to substantiate that, because there's not exactly a one-to-one match, you, you know that's okay. You you can still accurately or or do your best effort to you know to report the liability. You know, as you mentioned, there there's a whole plethora of different forms that people might get, and um, in some situations they may not even get a form. So, would you recommend that people? And obviously, well, nothing that we say in the show is advice for any you know particular person. But how should people decide which type of accountant to use? Um, if one at all, I don't know if, you know, tax software is, is good enough, but how should people think about this decision? Yeah, I think, um, first of all, I think you're going to need some type of tax software tool because this software tool help you kind of reconcile all the activity across multiple wallets and exchanges, unless you're just using one exchange, which is not the case. A typical crypto user have two to three exchanges. They have transfers in and out. Uh, they have coins purchased at different time periods at different prices. So it's, reconciling this activity manually or even using an accountant is, is virtually impossible. So, so just know that there are tax software that's going to help you kind of reconcile your entire tax profile. Uh, so you need that. And then the, the second, you can use a, a DIY software like, you know, TurboTax in conjunction with one of these tax software, uh, or you can use like a dedicated an accountant to help you file your taxes. Um, so do not expect your accountant or accounting firm to kind of do these reconciliations. It, it, it's, it's impossible, especially if you're a complicated taxpayer. So just know that there are tax software and after you connect everything to your tax software, you can either use a DIY tool or dedicated crypto, uh, you know, specialized accountant to, to file and uh, be compliant with your taxes. Yeah, I would say, you know, especially if you if you have a complicated situation, you know, uh, accounting firm is uh, at RSM, we're, you know, able to help out in, in, in very complicated situations. 
it, it sometimes it might take a you know an expert to help you reconcile the data you get if especially if if you're trading in multiple exchanges or in multiple protocols. All right. So obviously the other big hot topic from 2021 that involved crypto taxes was the provision from the infrastructure bill that addressed this issue. And it's sort of unclear what the outcome of that was. So can you outline what it is that people need to know about what happened there and you know what they should do uh, for this year's taxes and also, I guess, probably future taxes? Sure. So the infrastructure bill passed and uh, it had some uh, language that's affecting the, the crypto community. I think the main one is that the, the infrastructure bill is mandating cryptocurrency exchanges to issue 10, 9 and Bs for the 2023 tax year and onwards. So uh, I'm sure you guys have seen the form 10, 9 and B. This is the form that you get uh, if you trade stocks and securities in a, in a brokerage, like in a Robinhood or TD Ameritrade. So at the end of the year, you get this form. Uh, it has your sales price. It has your cost basis. Your job uh, is to just put those numbers into tax return and, and you're done. But in the crypto space, it doesn't happen. Uh, so infrastructure bill is trying to change that. Uh, from the taxpayer's point of view, it's actually, it's actually a good thing. Uh, because if you're just using just one centralized exchange, uh, starting, you know, 2024 tax season onwards, you're going to get that nice form 1099B. And hopefully that has your, you know, correct sales price and the correct cost basis. Uh, and, and your tax compliance is going to be super easy, uh, assuming you're just using just one uh, cryptocurrency exchange. But in most cases, that won't be the case due to the nature of this space. Like, for example, like think, let's think about stocks, like in, in stocks, Every stock that you need to buy is in just one brokerage. Like I don't need to go from Robinhood to TD Ameritrade, uh, or I don't. I don't need to transfer anything uh, in between brokerages. The other thing is that uh, the stocks don't allow you to buy another type of stock using another type of stock. For example, if I want to buy Apple and I have Google, I cannot exchange my Google to Apple directly. I got to come into cash and then buy the second stock. But in the crypto, it's the, it's a reverse of what I said. You know, you see a lot of transfers and people have multiple wallets and exchanges because this exchange offers you higher staking reward or this exchange has this coin. And 90%, uh, majority of the crypto transactions we see today, they, they are crypto to crypto trades. So when you have these, you know, complex transfers going in and out, and when you see these, you know, token to token transfers and, and especially between centralized and DeFi exchanges, it's good that you know these centralized exchanges are required to issue form 1099 Bs, but capturing the cost basis is going to be nearly impossible in in many cases, uh, especially if you're dealing with DeFi, which does which you know you cannot you know enforce these rules in a DeFi environment because these are protocols, right? You know, there's no teams or anything like that. So in that case, you know you're going to see a 1099 B, but the cost base is going to be either missing or inaccurate. The other situation where that the 1099B is going to be incorrect would be uh, if you're self-custodying your asset. You know, a lot of people are self-custodying their asset uh, for privacy and security reasons. So imagine, you know, I bought a, you know, I have my Bitcoin uh, in my ledger wallet. I transfer it to say Coinbase and I sell it for 50,000. Uh, Coinbase would issue me a 50,000, uh, you know, a sale proceed 1099B, but it wouldn't know my cost basis. So there are so many uh, areas where that the 1099B regime could fail in the crypto uh, space, but uh, in my opinion, like it's a, it's a right, uh, it's it's good that the, the the regulators are thinking about it, and especially if you're just doing crypto exchanges in just one exchanges, 1099B is going to help uh, you know, people with tax tax funding obligations. But just just don't blindly rely on 1099Bs. Uh, that that's my advice. I agree with you, and um, I, I think the IRS will use this opportunity uh, in in the infrastructure bill, probably to again to issue a different kind of form, a 1099 for digital assets that will be a little more specific. The um, infrastructure bill does provide for reporting. If if you stay on the major exchanges, they will report transfers to the IRS. So in a lot of ways, that will be beneficial to taxpayers. They will see that you transferred from one exchange to another, and they will have a record of that, uh, of the acquisition and the basis. Uh, where there will be gaps is when you move to where, where there isn't a third party, where it's a decentralized, as Sheehan said, really decentralized exchanges will is where there will be a problem 
or if you transfer money off of the exchange into a, a cold wallet or, or, or your own storage, uh, then the IRS will lose visibility into that. The chance of getting misreported proceeds that don't match up to your basis will increase. So there are there are limitations. I, th- I think, though, that the infrastructure bill will help improve the accuracy of the reporting. And f- what about businesses that transact in crypto? Are there any particular forms that they might need to file? Yeah, so there's another provision in the uh, infrastructure bill, uh, Code Section 6050I. Uh, so that's mandating uh, businesses who are accepting cryptocurrencies in exchange of uh, $10,000 to file this form called Form 8300. Essentially, like, let's say, you know, I, I want to go to a dealership, I want to I buy a car, and instead of uh, giving that person, you know, $50,000, I'm just sending uh, one Bitcoin, which is worth $50,000. So now that business is required to file Form 8300, uh, disclosing, uh, you know, my identity, uh, you know, who, who I got paid from, my social security, and the reasons for the transaction, et cetera. It doesn't involve any taxes. It's more about disclosure. Uh, so infrastructure bill, uh, you know, at that, at that, uh, actually that form 8300 existed for cash transactions. Infrastructure bill expanded that into digital assets as well. And John? Yeah, I was just going to say the 8300 uh, is, is, is a, uh, that part of the law is driven by the uh, uh, financial uh, enforcement uh, uh uh, Treasury's Financial Enforcement Center, and uh, the you know I think the challenge will be for businesses because I know a lot of businesses are worried about the the burden of you know filing multiple forms. It's not uh, it's not uncommon to receive you know have activity greater than ten thousand uh, dollars. So the uh, the challenge will be to to get the regulators to try and mimic the regulations to as much as possible to cash and and you know right now if you receive payment in a check uh, that's traceable you you don't you don't file the form so. Hopefully, we will uh, kind of reach a reporting uh, uh, situation where it mimics cash as much as possible uh, and not just every single transaction of greater than $10,000 in virtual currency. Yeah, and I know there was concern that this would affect individuals who uh, made trades of more than $10,000 worth, which I think happens pretty often in crypto. So, you know, does it look like individuals will have to report on personal identifying information of their transaction partners? To my knowledge, uh, Laura, this Form 8300 is applicable only to trade or businesses. Um, so you have to be in a business of doing something. And what is a trade or business is a matter of facts and circumstances. There's no like a bright line rule or anything like that. So I think the confusion came from like, you know, what about some of these um, uh, staking pool providers and et cetera? Uh, those could be treated as a trade of business, again, depending on, on the facts and circumstances, you know, how involved they are, is it really a trade of business or something else? But it doesn't apply to, to, to individual uh, participants. It's, it's for trade of businesses. All right, so in a moment, we're gonna talk more about specific scenarios involving crypto transactions. But first, a quick word from the sponsors who make this show possible. Alchemy Pay is the pioneer of the world's first truly hybrid crypto and fiat payment network that makes real-world crypto payments easy, secure, and instant for both merchants and users. It is currently being used by merchant partners in more than 70 countries for online and offline, consumer-to-business, and business-to-business transactions. Through partnerships with Shopify, NIUM, and Binance, as well as integrations with Algorand, Polygon, and Avalanche, Alchemy Pay is making crypto investment, commercial transactions, and DeFi services readily accessible to consumers and institutions in the fiat economy. Head to alchemypay.org to see how you can facilitate easy crypto acceptance for your business. Follow Alchemy Pay on Twitter at at Alchemy Pay, bridging fiat and crypto economies. Join over 10 million people using crypto.com the easiest place to buy, earn, and spend over 150 cryptocurrencies. New users enjoy zero credit card fees on crypto purchases in their first 30 days. With Crypto.com Earn, you can get industry-leading interest rates of up to 8.5% on over 40 coins, including Bitcoin, and earn up to 14% on stablecoins. 
With the Crypto.com Visa card, you can spend your crypto anywhere. Enjoy up to 8% cash back instantly, plus 100% rebates for your Netflix, Spotify, and Amazon Prime subscriptions, and zero annual fees. Download the Crypto.com app and get $25 with the code LAURA. Link in the description. Bosonic is the new decentralized financial market infrastructure. Bosonic eliminates counterparty credit and settlement risk for institutions. Do you want to gain maximum capital efficiency with the lowest possible risk? Do you want to separate custody from liquidity provision? Do you want to eliminate opening accounts and funding at exchanges? Do you want to avoid bilateral credit and bilateral settlement movements with market makers? Do you wish you could be fully cross-margined and go long on one exchange, short on another, and be net flat instantly? Bosonic lets you trade on global aggregated liquidity from the safety and convenience of your own custodial account. Bosonic is institutional DFMI that empowers clients rather than competing with them. Finance is changing. Strategies are changing. Holding is changing. Beefy Finance, the multi-chain yield optimizer, allows you to maximize passive income while you sleep. Simply deposit your crypto into Beefy's secure, industry-leading auto-compounding vaults to put your funds to work. Each one of Beefy's 740 vaults automatically reinvests the interest gained on your crypto deposits, earning you more, while saving you time and fees. Beefy's strategies create bank-busting APYs with 0% deposit fees at the click of a button. Join $1.4 billion of investments and understand why so many users trust Beefy with their financial independence. Visit beefy.finance and take control of your financial future. Back to my conversation with Shihan and John. So um, as of the time of this recording, there was a very big tax topic that everyone was discussing recently, and that was a case involving Joshua and Jessica Jarrett. Can one of you recap that case and the kind of the recent development? I don't know if outcome is quite the right word. And then talk about what that means for crypto investors who participate in staking. Sure. Uh, so Jarrett's, uh, there are a couple from Tennessee. They uh, were staking Tezos during 2019, and they received roughly $9,000 worth of you know, tasting rewards. Uh, and then they reported that uh, staking rewards as income uh, at the time they received it in, in their 2019 tax return. And then, uh, you know, 2020, they amended the tax return saying that staking rewards should not be taxed at the time of the receipt because staking reward is a newly created property. So their argument was that, uh, you know, if you're an author and if you're creating a, a new book and actually, Laura, you, you had your, you know, newly created book recently. At the time of this recording, it'll be coming out a, a one week later. <laughs> okay, great. So you didn't, you didn't have to pay taxes at the time you're done authoring the book. You know, you pay taxes when you, when you sell your uh, book on Amazon or wherever, and when you receive the cash. So that's a valid argument. And if you look at the, the other areas of taxation, like, you know, imagine that you're, you're like a miner that's actually, you know, mining for gold or mineral or something like that. You don't pay taxes at the time you take you, you might, uh, you know, resources out of the ground. You pay taxes at the time you sell those, you know, newly created property. Uh, at the market, um, same thing goes with uh, farmers. You know, you don't you don't pay taxes at the time you see uh, you, your crops coming out of the ground. You pay taxes at the time you take the harvest and and go sell it in the market. So they had the same argument about um, you know staking rewards. And then uh, around 2020, uh, 2021, IRS uh, said, okay, it's fine. Uh, you know, you're right. We're going to refund you. Uh, that whatever the excess taxes they had to uh, pay because they reported that staking rewards at the time they received it. Interestingly, Jared said, uh, no, I don't want to accept the refund. Uh, I actually want to know the reason why you are issuing me a refund. Uh, so Jared wanted to have the refund because uh, the reason for the, for the refund, because if, if they can get a reason from the IRS, that can set precedent for like, you know, other stakers. Uh, as you know, the, the proof of stake has uh, become so popular lately. So that's where we are today. So the, the latest, you know, news in, in that case was that uh, Jared's 
uh, decline to accept the refund. They're taking this to the court uh, so they can uh, figure out the exact reason. And that reason is going to be super valuable for other stakers to rely on. So that's the case. The case is not finalized yet. And IRS didn't issue any, you know, staking specific tax guidance or anything like that, because that's what you see a lot of people are talking about. Uh, but, uh, but it's a very interesting development in the, in the, in this space. Yeah. I would just say one, Shane, uh, I, I agree with Shane. At one point though, the, that, that, that was part of the problem. The IRS didn't say you're right, Jarrett. The IRS just said, here's your money, Jarrett. So now let's just call it a day and, and, and move on. And, uh, the Jarrett's are like, well, what about next year? <laughs> uh, so, uh, uh, the, it'll be interesting to follow, to watch, um, and to see if we can get more specific guidance. So, John, and what's your take on why they didn't provide a reason? Uh, I, I really don't know. Um, I just know that when I was litigating cases, I would like something more to rely on than like a, a Q&A or question and answer from the IRS. Uh, I, I think federal judges, uh, they, they look to the regulations, they look to the law, and, and, and really kind of the strongest point that the IRS has out there now is a uh, question uh, pertaining to mining that was issued back in 2014. Um, and I just know that, you know, if I went into federal court and, and, I, and I gave the judge a question and answer from the IRS that wasn't a regulation, uh, they would not, uh, you know, they would look askance upon that. That, that I think so. I, I'm not exactly sure why they didn't give an answer. I, I but the, it 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 really is reflective. Um, I think that the guidance isn't very strong. You know, leaves a possibility, uh, an opening for the taxpayers to take a position that staking income uh, is created property, and it's not recognized until you actually sell or exchange it. Just like when you sell your book or when you sell your crops. And so. You know, as we said earlier, nothing in this show is tax advice, but for all the different people who did earn stinking income this year, how would you expect most of them or their accountants to decide how to handle this? I see like, you know, taxpayers, you know, some taxpayers are conservative, so they are still fine reporting income at the time they receive it. And then they will recognize income when they later sell it. Honestly, it's a matter of timing uh, because let me give an example because when I when I say it's a matter of timing, like you know, uh, other people wouldn't understand. So let, let's say you receive like a Tezos reward today, uh, which is for two dollars, uh, and then you decide to go on the conservative route and you report that two dollars today at the time you receive it, and then later you're selling it for twenty dollars, and when you sell it for twenty dollars, you would report eighteen dollars worth of capital gains because you established a cost basis by reporting that two dollars worth of income. So that's a conservative route. And that's what a lot of people have been doing uh, up until this case. Now, in case if you want to be, I don't want to say aggressive, uh, I, I want to say non-conservative and, you know, follow the Jared's case, uh, you could decide not to report any income at the time you receive uh, that Tezos reward. Uh, in my case, so you receive, we receive $2 worth of Tezos reward, but you decide not to report any income, so zero income. And couple of years later, you would sell that Tezos for $20. In that case, you would report $20 worth of capital gains. So if you compare the two transactions, you would end up recognizing the same amount of income subject to taxes, but it's just a matter of timing. In the conservative one, you report a little bit of income today, and then you, know, you defer that other income to later. In the, the non-conservative way, you, you don't pay taxes today whatsoever, but it doesn't mean that you're completely immune from taxation. You, you got to pay taxes for the entire month when you later sell it. I don't mean to interrupt you, Shane, but I would say that when when you sold it, if you didn't if you didn't recognize gain upon receipt, then then it would be ordinary gain. Uh, it would be ordinary income if, if your sales w were were later on, uh, if you treated it as uh, created property. Well, it make, makes sense. Uh, so those are the two approaches that, that I see, like a lot of people are taking. Uh, and I've also seen from some of my accounting colleagues that they're getting requests from uh, taxpayers uh, asking, can they amend the return based on, you know, the, the case, uh, you know, law? Because typically you can only amend up to the past three years and, and request a refund. So, you know, it, it's also a timing thing, right? Because if you have been um, proof of stake, you know, earning rewards for a while, now that 
the, the small window that you have to, you know, amend the return and get back the refund is, is closing. So that's another thing uh, the accountants are dealing with. Uh, I would say talk to your accountant and, and see if it's worth, you know, amending the return. Right? For example, if it costs you a thousand dollars to amend the return and your refund's going to be, uh, you know, eight hundred dollars, it doesn't make any sense because you're going to be at a net loss position. So uh, talk to an accountant. Uh, amending is a somewhat complex process. Uh, I would not encourage you to do it on your own. Talk to an accountant. You know, weigh the pros and cons and, and see what's right for you. All right. So let's also now talk about tokens that get rebased uh, and what that means would be tokens where uh, the circulating supply of those tokens is changed. How should people who own such tokens calculate their taxes? I think the right answer is nobody knows. And I would love to get Joan's thoughts as well. Uh, Iris hasn't issued any you know, guidance uh, on this. Again, whenever there's, you know, gray areas and in the crypto space, there's so many gray areas. I like to take two positions. Uh, you know, conservative position is to, to report income at the time you're receiving it. Income under the IRS code, uh, it's covered by section 61. It's, it's a very broad code section. So unless something is specifically excluded from that, it's typically, or it's safe to say that's income. I know it's not super tax payer friendly, but that's how it is. If it, so if you're going to that, you know, super conservative route, I don't want to get into any type of, you know, even, even like a remote travel from the IRS, I will report those, you know, rebasing tokens at the time you receive it, establish the cost basis. And when you later sell it, you would have a capital gain or capital loss event. Again, it's, it's a timing difference. And if you want to kind of rely on this, you know, Jared's case, because some, most of these rebasing tokens are based on, you know, some type of staking type of mechanism, you could decide not to report any income. And then, you know, recognize the full gain when you later sell those rebasing tokens into cash or another type of token. So those are the two approaches that I would take. I, I would agree. I, I think you would you definitely want to talk to an accountant, especially if the, uh, based upon the protocol of the case. And some of the rebasing tokens, the amount, the fluctuation, the rebasing can occur quite rapidly. So, uh, I mean, I, I, I want to say that the answer can't be you have to do it, you know, every single time that there is a rebase, uh, but we don't really know for certain. I think you need to talk to an accountant to examine the protocol of these actual token. But what, uh, you know, kind of what Sheehan describes is w if there isn't a lack of guidance and if the taxpayer takes a reasonable and consistent position, I think that then the taxpayer is probably uh, in a safe place uh, on an audit or, or, or clearly in a safe place for any kind of accuracy related penalties, as long as they are, you know, if they, if they do what's practical, what's reasonable, and they're consistent. You can't take one position on one year and then take an inconsistent position or a different position on another year. Okay. And there were a couple other big events. One was that this past year, there were a few different groups that received airdrops and there are slightly different types of airdrops from uh, years past. One was uh, for users of Ethereum name service, and the other was for users of OpenSea. How would those airdrops be taxed for uh, the different uh, groups uh, affected by those? I actually tweeted about this uh, as well, but just to kind of keep it at a high level. Uh, so the way that we're seeing airdrops are happening today, uh, in my opinion, has changed a lot. Uh, if you compare it to past, you know, three, four years. Uh, I remember back in 2016, 2017, you would set up some type of wallet and the next day you open up your wallet and you, you, your balance has increased because of an airdrop. So it just get credited automatically. But 2020 and even 2021, uh, the way that these protocols uh, conduct these airdrops have changed a lot. So typically they announce and then you got to go to a dedicated website and pay some gas or, or some type of fee and claim the airdrop. So the question is, when is it taxed? Is it at the time you have the knowledge of the airdrop or is it at the time you actually claim the airdrop? The, the answer, it depends. Uh, it depends again that the, um, the, there's no uh, exact rules uh, that have been issued by the IRS on the airdrops. Some people believe that the, the 2019 uh 4 Remedy ruling issued by the IRS address airdrops. Uh, I don't believe so. If you if you read the uh, the remedy ruling, they're talking about an airdrop that happens after a hard fork. 
Uh, so the wording there is a little bit confusing because airdrops and hard forks are, you know, two mutually exclusive things, you know, uh, airdrop don't happen after a hard fork. I mean, obviously, yes, you get free coins, but that's not an airdrop. Now that said, uh, some of the concept that we mentioned in that uh, revenue ruling is important for us to kind of form an opinion on, you know, how these you know, new types of airdrops uh, should be taxed. So just kind of by relying on IRS's logic, if it's a claimable uh, airdrop, uh, it should be taxed, in my opinion, uh, at the time you claim it, because when you claim it, you gain dominion and control over the asset. And that uh, you claim it and you report uh, income equal into the market price at the time you claim it, and, and that's a taxable event for you. And if you decide not to claim it, then you don't have a taxable event and you let it expire. Uh, and, and that's completely fine too. I'm pretty sure there's so many people who didn't claim these things because they had no knowledge. And if we keep saying that, Okay, you gotta, you know, tax airdrop at the time you receive it. But what, what about the people who don't even know about it? It just doesn't make any sense. So, I've also seen people claim them, but because they're so new, because they're there's almost impossible to value, that they give a, a minimal value at the time of receipt, uh, recognizing that if they later sell it, that 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 they will, rec- you know, they have basically. They have little or no basis where they actually sell it and they will recognize the gain. So I, I think that that's also another, uh, you know, a reasonable position if it's a if it's a brand new coin that many of them just go valueless uh, very quickly anyways, just assign it a minimal value upon receipt. So due to high gas fees this past year, there were also a lot of people that were transacting on layer twos, uh, moving, you know, money there. How are those tr- transactions taxed, if at all? Yeah, so if we strictly follow the IRS rules, uh, again, I would love to hear Jones' opinion here as well. You're spending gas fee, meaning you're disposing of a property, in this case, Ethereum. Uh, disposing of a property creates a taxable event. So, um, you know, so, every, so each time you, you pay gas fees, you know, you, you're disposing of an Ethereum. And that if, if that if Ethereum has appreciating value, that gas fee creates a capital gain. And if that Ethereum or like you know small portion of the Ethereum has you know depreciated in value, that gas fee creates a capital loss. So that that's how I would uh, approach gas fees. I would agree that uh, if you pay your gas fees with a coin that is a disposition of the coin and, and it can create a gain or a loss, the actual the proceeds from that. That that transaction, though the actual fee itself, uh, you may be able to capitalize into the acquired coin as a cost of the transaction. All right, and then uh, there was another big phenomenon this year. Uh, it really started um, the year prior, but I guess we could say um, you know earlier it might have been limited to other geographies. There are a lot of people playing play to earn games, such as Axie Infinity. And for those players, how would their earnings or losses be taxed? Again, I, I would rely on the section 61 of the IRS code. I, I encourage everybody to just, just Google section 61 and, and see what it says. Uh, section 61 defines you know, gross income. Again, it's a very broad code section. Uh, anything that you receive is generally treated as income, otherwise, uh, unless it's otherwise specifically excluded from that code section. So. If you're playing a game and if you're earning something, uh, in if you if you rely on the general you know tax principle, that constitutes a, a taxable income. Now there's an argument. I mean, is it newly created property, right? If it's newly created property, you can take two positions. So generally speaking, if you want to be conservative, I would report those you know newly re- tokens that you receive uh, when you earn, when you win, win something or when you achieve certain milestones as as income. Again, going with the conservative approach that establishes your cost basis, and when you later sell it, that creates a capital gain. Uh, or you can take that other approach. Okay, these are newly created tokens, and um, I want to kind of rely on this Jared's case, and uh, I'm not going to report anything at the time I receive it. Uh, I'm going to pick up that entire income when you later sell it. So those are the two ways that that I would approach that that question. Yeah, I think the second point is a variation of the Jared's argument that. One, it, if it's in the game, uh, the to- coins earned in the game are created property, and, and until it actually leaves the game or leaves the protocol, uh, that it's not taxable. Okay, so I'm because we're kind of running out of time, I'm going to do lightning round. So I'll just ask one of you 
to discuss each of the next scenarios. Um, when people um, have bought or sold virtual land in different virtual realities, how are those transactions taxed? And John, do you want to take this one? Sure. Virtual land is uh, is not real property. <laughs> virtual land is personal property and it's taxed like any other token. Okay. And um, for when people wrap tokens, such as wrapping Bitcoin on Ethereum or wrapping ETH on Solana, how would those transactions be taxed, Shihan? Uh, I hate to give this answer, but it depends. <laughs> uh, if you're going from uh, Bitcoin to wrap Bitcoin, it's more likely, uh, it, it's very likely that it's not a taxable event because an exchange has a knocker. In order for, you, for an exchange to happen under the IRS you know, regulations, your tax ownership need to go from you to, a, to another person. Uh, if I'm giving one Bitcoin to the wrap protocol, if I'm receiving wrap Bitcoin, I haven't exchanged anything. I, I'm in the same economic position as I was earlier. So in that case, that's not a taxable event. But there could be other wrapping situations that could trigger a taxable event. So uh, I'm not going to go into that because ev everything is it's different. So we got to talk to economy. <laughs> okay. And so for people who use credit cards that give crypto rewards, how are those taxed, John? I think for the most part that they are uh, treated as rebates from purchases, just like your cash back on your current cards. So those aren't considered uh, taxable because it's it's really just a a reduction in purchase price that's borne by the uh, the card issuer or the vendor. But then is that income though? Because they're like, if you receive crypto, is it like an you know? So or so when you receive the crypto, it would be a rebate. If you then later sell it then it would be a taxable oh. uh, a taxable sale and and you would not have had any basis in that coin that you sold. Oh, got it. Okay. In general, what problems would you say crypto people face each year when they go to pay their taxes? Like what are some of the kind of uh, trends that you, like common pitfalls that you see, Shihan? Yeah, I think a lot of people, they don't even know where to start. I think that that's a, uh, the common pitfall and um, uh, common thing that we see. Uh, a lot of people are getting different types of tax from the exchanges and some exchanges are not providing any tax forms and people get confused. Okay, what should I rely on type of thing? I would say those are the uh, the main things. And, 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 and last but not least, like just kind of blindly relying on tax forms issued by the exchanges. Uh, I wouldn't do that. Just Just make sure they look right to you because, by the way, don't blame all the exchanges and exchanges are doing the best they can. If they don't do that, they're going to get penalized as well. Uh, and just know that they're working with limited information that they have uh, because they only have access to what you're doing inside that exchange. Uh, so just uh, don't blindly rely on any of the 1099s. Just make sure you reconcile them and talk to an accountant. Use a crypto tax software tool to, to get to the truth. And John, what are some ways that people can save on their taxes, particularly if they are heavy crypto users? I, if they're heavy crypto users, I would encourage people to use a lot of the available softwares that are out there. They enable you to uh, right right now crypto since it's specific. You can uh, specify if you want to sell high basis assets or, or low basis assets. You have a lot of flexibility um, uh, on, on when you want to which, which lots you want to sell when you use the software. And some of them even allow you to program in. Uh, I, you know, I want to sell high this week. I want to sell low next week. In that, in that case, that's perfectly fine as long as you don't sell the same lot twice. Uh, so uh, I would encourage people that are heavy users of crypto to use a software program uh, to help track basis. And what about um, wash sales in crypto and other ways of tax loss harvesting? What would you recommend there? You know, I know Sheehan has written a lot about that. That there, there, there are no provisions involving wash sales. Um, I, I'm, I'm a little concerned with sales that happen instantaneously. That the IRS might take the position that the sale, uh, they could ignore the economic substance of that transaction. Um, I would prefer to see a little period of time between a buy and a sell. You know, before you, you know, you harvest your tax losses. Because that that then it looks more like a realistic, you know, that they are two independent transactions. Uh, so that is true that there is no wash sale rule, but there's also a, a, a danger of the IRS ignoring uh, the economic substance of your transaction if it happens instantaneously. 
Okay. So in general, I, I have done a show on crypto taxes um, pretty much every year for the last, I think like, I'm not sure, four or five years. I, I don't remember how many years, but the point is that it's definitely an evolving space. So going forward, how would you, and both of you now can answer this, how would you expect that crypto taxes will evolve in the future? Let me start here, I guess. Uh, I think the uh, taxes need to be rethought in a, in a decentralized role. I actually tweeted about that, Laura. I think you, you shared that. I think the world is moving from an account-based financial system to a wallet-based financial system. So in an account-based financial system, which is the one that we are living today, if you want to start your financial journey, you would go to a, you know, Robin Hoods or Coinbase of the world. You, you set up an account using a username and a password, and your account is tied to your actual real world identity to, to this process called KYC, know your customers. So you have the exchanges, you have you, uh, and then you have the IRS. The exchanges or, or the brokerages, they work as a third party information reported to the IRS. And that's why you get these form 1099. So whenever you get a form 1099, that information has already been reported to the IRS by the intermediary, the third party, in this case, the exchange. Now, the tax works in that type of environment because of that third party information system, right? Because you get triggered to file taxes when you get some type of tax form, you know, that, that's a simple story. Now, that's in an account-based system. So the, the tax compliance is very high when you get that tax form because there's a third party to kind of see your transaction reported to the IRS, which, you know, uh, imposes taxes. Now, we're seeing, uh, you know, more and more protocols and, you know, founders, they're building stuff on Web3, uh, which is based on wallets. Like, take a look at, you know, platforms like wallets, uh, OpenSea. Like, you can uh, sign up for, you know, OpenSea using a pseudonymous wallet and you are interacting directly with, with other people. Uh, and then the OpenSea as a protocol kind of facilitated that transaction, but they're not a third party uh, that who knows who you, uh, uh, that knows who you are, or they don't do any type of KYC because of how the Web3 functions. So in that type of environment, this whole 1090T slash, um, you know, third party information reporting system breaks uh, because you're literally doing transaction peer to peer facilitated by some type of protocol, but not an intermediary in that type of environment. So we really have to set the right incentives for people to pay taxes. You know, regulators have to be very, very creative when it comes to figuring out even taxable events and, 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 you know, not only, you know, coming up with new regulations, but just to make sure that those are enforceable in that type of pseudonymous environment. So. I would say the next several years, you know, we're going to see like, you know, a lot of people talking about this issue um, and, and hopefully we can find out a solution uh, that's beneficial for everybody. And John, with your years of experience at the IRS, do you think that's possible or? I, th I think it will take a lot of cooperation or a lot of work with developers in the industry. The issue really with the, you know, wallet-based taxes is not third-party reporting. So the answer won't be third-party reporting. The answer will be, uh, you know, proper development of protocols to help taxpayers uh, that use wallet-based systems to actually report their tax liability. Oh, so, okay. But, right. I mean, that's the thing. I, I feel like it's a little bit more like an honor system. It is an honor system, but I, I actually, the, you know, if it's a true independent wallet-based system, it is not maybe pseudo-anonymous, uh, but I, I think eventually there are, you know, the, the taxpayers, if, if they might need to leave the system, they would, they would uh, need to convert to fiat. I think taxpayers run the risk of assuming just because I'm operating in a uh, DeFi environment and a wallet-based environment that there's no third-party reporting that um, uh, I don't need to report my gains and losses from that. Uh, th there's, you know, eventually those assets need to be converted. Those assets are exchanged. Eventually there's something that would, could trigger um, a recognition or, 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 or an audit. Yeah. I think the other thing I wonder about is as the industry moves more toward privacy, what that is really going to mean, because then I think it will be even harder. So, um, but I think that's a bit further down the road. We'll see. Um, one other thing I wanted to mention was I happened to notice that the IRS posted a job or it might've been like a contractor position. And essentially they were looking for someone who could exploit 
uh, develop exploits for crypto wallets for seizure. Can you talk a little bit more about what you think that might mean and what the IRS is looking to do with with this posting? I don't know for certain, um, and, and but just based upon what I've read publicly in, in other instances, is that the IRS will aggressively seize assets for a taxpayer, a, a, recalcitrant, a recalcitrant taxpayer. And that could involve a cold wallet, um, that could involve investigatory techniques. So uh, the IRS will use, um, will use other means to actually uh, seize property of taxpayers' property, especially if they believe the taxpayer is attempting to uh, move the property out, outside of the reach or to, uh, to hide it. So um, I, I think uh, the IRS recognizes some of the limitations of third-party reporting and is not going to rely solely on that to, uh, to enforce the tax laws. All right. To wrap up, is there anything else that you, either of you, feel that crypto people need to know about paying their taxes this year? Or uh, did we did we manage to cover <laughs> all the important issues? I, I think, again, do you make your best efforts, use the information you have. Um, and, and when we when you're stuck, can consult someone in an accountant um, and, and that, you know, you'll be well positioned uh, should you be audited by the IRS. All right. Okay. Uh, and Shihan, is there anything else that you wanted to add? No, I mean, lastly, just, uh, I, I know taxes suck. Uh, unfortunately, you know, we had to, you know, report them and you know, pay your fair share of taxes. At the same time, just know that there are so many legal ways that you can save your tax bills, uh, like, you know, taxes harvesting, you know, getting a loan against money uh, and, you know, you know, earning credit card reversing, et cetera. Uh, so just just use the tax code to your advantage uh, going forward. Uh, don't think about taxes only at the tax time. Think about taxes throughout the year. Uh, that's the way to to minimize your tax bill. Okay, great. Where can people learn more about each of you and your work? I, I'm pretty active on Twitter. My handle is at the crypto CPA. Uh, you can find me writing on the coin tracker or IO blog and, and and Forbes as well. And we're at rsmus.com. We have an uh, excellent uh, digital asset practice and we're willing, you know, can help any taxpayers with, with their liabilities. Perfect. Well, thank you both so much for coming on Unchained. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks so much for joining us today. To learn more about Shihan, John, and crypto taxes, be sure to check out the show notes for this episode. Unchained is produced by me, Laura Shin, with help from Anthony Yoon, Daniel Ness, Mark Murdoch, Shashank, and CLK Transcription. Thanks for listening. 